thank you for joining us uh, today for this exploration of, of contemplative prayer. I think I can say without any contradiction that uh, uh, the church and indeed humanity itself, in, at least in broad terms, is experiencing a renewal of contemplative life and what it stands for, which is basically the the transformation of consciousness into Christ consciousness, or if you prefer, God consciousness. This is ultimately, uh, it seems to me, the project of the gospel, is to invite us into the divine life. And the liturgy uh, constantly explains how this has been done, is being done, and is to be done. So we're enfolded with enormous mysteries and endowed with incredible gifts that enable us to respond to this invitation of God to enter into the divine life. The Christian tradition is not about becoming a better human being, however uh, desirable that might be for ourselves and our relatives and friends. But <laughs> we're invited to become divine human beings. And any other understanding of Christian life is, is a misunderstanding or inadequate presentation. It's, it's not just a religion. This is important. It's a life to be lived, a life that we don't have of our own initiative, but which is freely and gratuitously offered to us by a God of incredible humility and incredible love. And uh, the passion, death, resurrection of Jesus that we just celebrated a few weeks ago is, is God's uh, signature that creation and his project to transform the human family is still good. It still works as far as he's concerned. And, and the resurrection is an enormous affirmation of the goodness of creation, even in its badness. In other words, the project that God has is to show the power of divine love to overcome any, all, and any amount of evil in us personally or in the uh, human composite as a whole. So uh, the contemplative dimension of the gospel is this uh, conviction, this enlightenment, this understanding that this is the goal of life, that this is the purpose of, of the gospel, this is the purpose of any ritual, any prayer, any social action, any ministry, any liturgy that we do. Its aim is union with God, and not just an abstract concept of union, but the actual experience of divine union that we all hope to experience in its fullness in heaven, but is designed to be anticipated and lived even in this life. As far as I can see, the transforming union, which is uh, considered the term now of, of the Christian spiritual journey, is only the beginning. It's the normal Christian life. Everything else is sub-Christian in, in the fullest sense of the word or in the perspective of the project that Jesus has revealed to us. So right now, uh, the, the whole world, but especially the Christian tradition, and, and more particularly the Roman Catholic tradition, is going through a renewal of the Christian contemplative tradition. Now tradition in this sense is very similar to what they call in the Eastern spiritual disciplines, the lineage. The lineage is, is the experience that the founder of the religion or the reformers of it, of those who embodied it in the full sense of the word, are, uh, uh, are trying to experience and interiorize and assimilate into their own lives by submitting to some enlightened teacher, guru, master, whatever the term is in the particular 
tradition you're talking about. In other words, it's an interior view, you might say, of what we call apostolic succession. It's not just, however, the laying on of hands and the, conf and the conferring of a certain character to the spiritual uh, soul of, of the candidate. It's rather the transmission of the experience of Christ, of the Father as Abba. This is the revolution in the Christian tradition. God is not just the creator and father in that sense. He's daddy. That's what uh, Abba means. He's papa or dada or whatever the interior, endearing term that you might have for the dearest of parents and I might add dearest of mothers, of course, is contained in this word. So that the idea of God is merely transcendent, the, uh, the judge of the world, uh, the, uh, the, the force behind all that exists, the creator, the energy of the universe that keeps it going, whether infinitesimally or grandiosely, as in the galaxies. This marvelous God is so close, so near, so tender, so loving, there's no word to describe this, but there is an experience of which the term Abba seems to express a, a hint of the mystery hidden in Jesus' experience. So the Christian tradition is really not books or documents handed down as important as these are, even the scriptures themselves. What makes a Christian is the experience that Christ had of God, the ultimate reality, as Abba. And he, he made it very clear in teaching us what we call the Our Father, that this Abba isn't just his Abba now, but is our Father, our Abba. In other words, Christ is the center, the head, and the source of the Christian lineage as an experience to be assimilated and to be assimilated by and to express it and embody it in our whole human life down to the smallest details of everyday life so that Christ can be us, or put it differently, Christ can experience human nature, humanity in each of us in our uniqueness and the more so in the degree in which we, we open and sink into the divine presence within us, which uh, Catholic theology calls the divine indwelling. This doctrine is the foundation of the spiritual journey. It's not about God out there as much as he's out there, but as much as he's out there, he's also in here, equally infinitely imminent as well as infinitely transcendent, and this was understood even in Jewish theology as it developed uh, through the prophets. So this is not just a nice devotion or a centering prayer aimed at being one other method to get a little quiet once in a day, which just from a human level you better find time for or you'll be seeing a psychiatrist soon. <laughs> this is a noisy, fast, incomprehensibly busy and active society that is constantly demanding our time, even when you're asleep. Some people go to bed with the earphones on. They've never known a moment of silence, hence they've never known who the heck they really are, which can only be communicated by time alone and finding out uh, just who we might be. But the, the, the centering prayer practice is an effort to, to contribute to this overall development, expansion, and renewal of the heart of Christian tradition, which is the experience that Christ had of the ultimate reality as Abba, Dada, tender, loving, close, forgiving closer than we are to ourselves. 
and supporting us in being body, soul, and spirit at every nanosecond of time so that if God were ever separated from us, we would turn into a grease spot instantaneously or less. So the most important thing about each of us is not us, but God within us. And, and, whole, and in this sense, the whole doctrine of the mystical body of Christ that Paul elaborates in Romans and elsewhere reminds us that in receiving grace or in the moment of baptism, we are incorporated in Christ and his incarnation his identification with human nature in general is applied to each of us in particular so that it's like an engagement between a two cup people who are very much in love and are considering making this relationship permanent. Scripture uses that human relationship as the primary uh, paradigm of how God feels and deals with each of us as, as the beloved, even, even when we are the opposite of the beloved. God's love uh, never changes. <laughs> so this, this, this doctrine is expressed in, in Matthew 6.6 6, in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. And in just a few words of this wisdom saying, Jesus outlines the umbrella or the overarching formula for entering into who we really are, discovering the true self, and beyond that, the divine indwelling that is the source of our being at every moment. There are many instances well documented in history and in our own time where the divine indwelling reaches up from its source deep within us and communicates, so to speak, without anybody's effort and free of charge, the reminder that we are dwelt in by a power that has as its, and its resources almost infinity. So sometimes God overwhelms people with his presence as a sudden experience. Sometimes even children have this experience. You can't count on it. You have to normally presume that there's a path that prepares our faculties and spirit and disengages us from the habits uh, that we bring with us from early childhood, which are based on a childish view of the universe and tend to persist unless you take the time and the energy to dismantle these false programs for happiness. The ancient term for this in Christian spirituality, of course, is asceticism. It's not primarily about external acts, though it may use them as a starting point. It's above all about repentance or a change of heart. Remember, this is the very first teaching Jesus gave after emerging from the desert in which the, his temptations mirror exactly and in their raw form the three basic instincts of human nature necessary to survive in early childhood but very inappropriate for an adult. Childish motivation will not work in adult life. So the gospel is first of all an invitation to grow up or to graduate from these infantile programs that have been developed by the psyche or the ego uh, around the basic energies of, for security and survival, power control, affection, esteem, and approval. These energy centers become fossilized in early childhood, greatly complexified in our socialization period from four to eight in which we interiorize unquestioningly the values of family, peers, ethnic group, national group, religious group, gang, and now the values are communicated on the internet and websites and movies and mass media and so on. 
So the child is inundated with false information about where true happiness is to be found, and it develops psychological habits deeply entrenched that brings to everyday life an enormous demand for gratification of what the culture offers by way of satisfaction or gratification of those three instinctual areas. In the Hindu tradition, these are identified as the first three chakras. Uh, Buddhists are familiar with this uh, information, and it's, it's, it's uh, spread in various ways and in different jargon according to the cultural conditioning in the various spiritualities of the Christian tradition. Nobody pays any attention to it until you're damn sick. And, are, and when you've been in a few rehab uh, institutions, it begins to dawn on you that maybe your programs for happiness are not going to work. But some don't find this out until their deathbed, where they're surrounded by psychiatrists and lawyers and nurses and relatives waiting to read the will and uh, all kinds of tubes all through you, and it suddenly dawns on you. Maybe my emotional programs for happiness were not so hot after all, even though the society and all advertising appeals to them. Every day you pick up a newspaper or turn on the television. What advertisement doesn't appeal to your commitment to security, power control, affection, esteem, and approval? A few appeal to our over-identification with the socialization period and the values of the group to which we belong, whether these are our family uh, or ethnic or what. Think of the damage that the commitment to ethnic loyalties has been in our time. We now see it in the Sudan in a ghastly form. We just saw it in Rwanda. They saw it, we saw it in Cambodia. We saw it in the Holocaust. It's, it, it's incredible the damage that is done by our over-identification with our group that is not the reasonable dedication of loyalty to what we have received from it, but the kind of, of naive loyalties that, that uh, refuse to acknowledge the defects of the group or the sins of the group or the social injustice of the group because they want, we want to be accepted by the group and the condition for that is that we accept its values, right or wrong. This is why you get some harsh sayings in the gospel because Jesus' program is, is to undermine these emotional programs for happiness and our over-identification with our group because it stands directly in the way of the gospel values. And so he says, for instance, unless you hate your relatives and children and property and your own self too, you cannot be my disciple. And there's four or five other places where that teaching of the narrow way that leads to life is really aimed head on at the attachments or the habitual entrenchment and the amount of our human energy that we pour into finding gratification for those emotional programs or to avoid uh, the pain of losing them. An addiction is the creation, the masterpiece of the false self that gets so preoccupied by an obsession for some particular way that it, it can't think anymore about how miserable it is or the pain of over-identification with one of those programs that has become so painful we need to be preoccupied with something all the time, such as an addiction provides. Well, in any case, uh, this, this awakening to who we are, which in our tradition is called self-knowledge, uh, all of these terms have a deep meaning, but they all need to be adjusted a little 
in our culture to make them understood by people who don't really identify with the old and traditional language of asceticism and, and company. Not that there's anything wrong with that, the idea is there. But we need new paradigms and by God's grace, some of the physical sciences are now giving us extraordinary paradigms that are much better, at least in my view, of communicating the mystery and the power of the gospel than some of the old ones, good in their day, but now needing to be replaced by ideas that have a certain psychological reality. So the false self, for instance, is a term that has been used by Merton and others and some uh, psychologists. It means exactly the same as Paul's statement, the old man. But you can't say the old man today because women would feel this was discriminatory. <laughs> Though they might like to be left out of that identification, I'm not sure. But anyway, here is Jesus' formula for addressing the human condition, also known as the consequences of original sin. I don't think that term is too popular today. In the first place, it never was a sin in the personal sense of the term. It was really the consequences of, of sinning that was attributed to, which we uh, inherited according to the story in Genesis and its traditional interpretation. In any case, what, what, we, uh, what Jesus is looking at is two things how to make us aware of the treasure of grace that we receive in baptism, which is a kind of engagement to a spiritual marriage that is the purpose of baptism in the first place, and the trousseau that God has given us to provide us with all that we need to attain this goal in the way of interior spiritual resources. And the and the first of these, of course, is the divine indwelling itself. Along with this goes the three theological virtues, the four infused moral virtues, justice, temperance, fortitude, and, and the other one. <laughs> and, and the fruits of the spirit, charity, joy, peace, patience, and the beatitudes that come from the seven gifts of the spirit. In other words, each of us at baptism is overqualified for transformation. You don't have to look any place else. You just have to activate the resources that have been freely given to you with the gift of grace in baptism. At the same time, there is this false self, these fossilized programs for happiness, deeply entrenched, absorbing our energies that we need to dismantle in some degree through the process of self-knowledge. And this gradually takes place over time and our cooperation in letting go of those things that the Spirit reveals to us to be obstacles to the uh, release of these supernatural gifts that I just described. So, so you have what looks to me like what might be called a divine therapeutic situation. The usual word for this, of course, is, is redemption, which really means healing. But it is a term that has enormous depth to it, and, and, and we've been meditating on it for years, centuries. The Following of Christ, The Imitation of Christ, that great book from the Middle Ages, spoke of, of the spiritual journey as the personal love of Christ, the imitation of Christ. Well, all that is being added here, which is certainly not denied, but presupposed in that great book, is, of course, that, that the, the divine presence is always with us and is, is, is healing and that is redemptive. So, so the friendship of Christ is both a relationship of friendship and a kind of a medication or therapy for the damage that has been done to us in growing up, usually through no fault of our own, and whatever damage we added under the influence of our childish emotional programs for happiness. 
The other gospel text that's kind of harsh is this one. If your eye scandalizes you, pull it out. If your foot scandalizes you, cut it off. The same with your hand. This is not, uh, doesn't sound like the language of a tender father, <laughs> does it? But, uh, 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 but it actually is. Wisdom teachers have the habit of speaking forcefully and exaggerating for the purpose of getting your attention. If you just speak in bland platitudes, no, you can, uh, your false self can easily pay no attention to it and turn on the television or call a friend or have a drink or something to distract themselves from this light of self-knowledge. But you can't do this if the statement grabs you. And the purpose is, once you, the wisdom teacher has got your intent, attention, then he insinuates the real message or content that he's trying to communicate. So in that saying, which is certainly harsh, if there ever was one, you can't, uh, moral theology wouldn't allow you to maim yourself that way. So he's not recommending uh, self-mutilation. What he's recommending is, and this is the way it was understood in the Desert Fathers, it means if your programs for happiness around security issues, approval, affection issues, and uh, power control issues, means more to you and is dearer to you than hand, foot, or eye. Cut that off because that is what is preventing you from entering into the kingdom of God, which is not an institution or a state of, of, of geopolitical authority, but is Christ's experience of the Father, of the ultimate reality as Abba. That's what the kingdom of God is. It's a state of consciousness primarily. Naturally, it has to be manifested in an incarnational way in, in a social uh, societal factors. But the, the heart or the deepest understanding of, of the kingdom is a change of heart. What change? To let go of your programs for happiness as a source of finding happiness. <laughs> they won't work. Jesus invites us to do this in a humane manner by assuming the discipline of prayer and action. If, if we don't do this, the only other choice is a disaster, a tragedy, an illness that shocks us or forces us to question the value of our emotional programs for happiness that are essentially childish will not work in adult life. And when these congregate into communities, nations, countries, and God help us, a global village, the world becomes a mess. It's not going to change unless we change. And so Jesus' first words after coming from the desert and confronting those three programs through the three temptations of the devil we celebrated uh, the first Sunday of every Lent is, 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 is simply this, repent, for the kingdom of God is very close. In fact, it was repeated, uh, I think, in the liturgy last Sunday in the gospel. Repent doesn't mean necessarily physical exercises of primarily, but these can be helpful as a starter or as a, as a support for the change of heart, which is the essential. So what Jesus is saying in that wisdom saying and all the way through his teaching, change the direction in which you're looking for happiness. Let go of looking for happiness in what is really idol worship, in the symbols or gratification of power, affection, esteem, and approval, and security that any particular culture or environment offers. Let go of that over-identification, or what the spiritual writers have always called attachment, which is something more than an attraction or an aversion. It's an involvement, a 
more or less deliberate involvement in those programs that use up an enormous amount of energy to no purpose. When that energy begins to be released through contemplative prayer, then it becomes available for the spiritual journey. And the energy then to deal with the difficulties of that journey, the opposition, or as Jesus pointed out, the persecution that we may have, will not blow us away. The tragedies, the disasters, even world disasters will no longer blow you away because you're not looking for a permanent place of happiness in this world. It doesn't exist here. If you don't like it, try another universe. It's not going to work. happen in this one. And for very good reason, uh, which you can't go into right now, but which has to deal with the nature of the Trinity itself, which is the community of oneness, of infinite unity that manifests itself in infinite diversity at the same time, both interiorly to the Trinitarian relationships and in creation, as you can see if you look around. So, so how to contact the kingdom, how to get into it, how to reduce the obstacles to it, how to enjoy it, how to be assimilated to it, how to embody the experience of Christ, of the Abba. This is what Christian tradition is. This is the lineage, and I venture to suggest without contemplative prayer, it can't be done, because this is the heart or the fullness of the gospel. And that's why you can see people doing all kinds of practices and devotions and not being changed. You can do all kinds of things for, the, for an inappropriate motivation. And so even, even uh, our major decisions of life, of marriage, entering religious life or priesthood, can be influenced by the emotional programs for happiness that see in this new environment a gratification for their particular needs that will take years to filter out and may destroy the vocation anyway. Uh, what is this formula that Jesus suggests? If you want to pray, he says, that is, if you want to enter into a deeper relationship with God that is consonant with your baptismal commitment, that is consonant with the treasures of grace that you've received, the three theological virtues and their growth. These are only seeds waiting to be cultivated, and it's up to us to introduce them into our life with the assistance of grace as far as we can and to learn more and more that through effort, we learn that efforts don't work. <laughs> Without that knowledge, you'll never be humble enough to receive the gratuity of the divine essence as sheer gift, and this is the only way it can be received. It cannot be earned, merited, or won. We cannot fix ourselves let alone anybody else. And so this, this, the depth of our realization of our nothingness, our dependence on God, is, is what gives the depth of motivation to be ready for any sacrifice in order to be rescued from this, I say it quite honestly, desperate illness that human nature has received, it might be called, the human condition. And that's why Jesus says in another place, if you try to save your life, meaning the false self with its programs for happiness, its idea of happiness, you will bring yourself to ruin. But if you bring yourself to nothing, you will find out 
who you are. This is Matthew 10, 39, I think is the one. You'll find that translation in the North American Bible used in the liturgy for years. It's since been replaced by the other translation, which seems to me to have been made by people who didn't grasp this distinction that I'm trying to make. <laughs> it's not your physical life that's the real issue. It's the attachment to the fault self that is the problem and the cause of all unhappiness. Death itself, when the fault self is laid to rest, is a pleasure. In fact, you can almost say death is God's greatest gift to humanity. Apart from some painful ways of getting through it, the fact itself is the door to the fullness of transformation and identification with Christ that's essential to enter into the bosom of the Father where he dwells and to sit with him at the right hand of the Father, which is the, the normal and logical destiny that Paul says has already happened as a result of being incorporated in the mystical body of Christ. That is, anything that Christ has is now ours. Not because we deserve it, but because Jesus has taken our melodrama completely into himself, overcome it by divine love and compassion, and has changed sin itself into unconditional love, the ultimate triumph of grace, of God's humility, and of his infinite goodness and tenderness, all of which he has uh, subscribed to all in, the, in, in blood with his signature and the blood of Christ saying, it, it, everything just as it is, is perfect. Well, if we want to pray, that is to say, if we want a deeper relationship with God, if we want to continue the one we have and allow it to enlarge, then try this formula. Enter your inner room, close the door, and pray to your Father in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, the desert fathers and mothers and their theologians, such as Evagrius and others, recognized in that text the formula really for any serious pursuit of the Christian contemplative tradition or the experience of the kingdom. It, it only became known as contemplation later in Christian history when the Neoplatonic worldview was chosen as a way of explaining the mysteries of Christ. But contemplation is not the same as what the Greeks meant by it because it was influenced by the personalist religious background of, of the Hebrews and the Jews. In any case, for those of you who are familiar with the spiritual journey and its uh, traditional stages as explained over a long period of experience, study, and training in the Christian tradition. The, the inner room takes on a lot more meaning if we allow into our reflections the new discoveries from psychology, not that psychology is a replacement for the spiritual journey, but it, there are certain scientific discoveries that are very important for the spiritual life and throws a light on it that was certainly known or intuited by the great mystics, but they didn't have a way to articulate it such as is now available in our time. And one of these chief discoveries is the discovery and articulation of the unconscious. You don't have to be a Freudian to accept that fact because almost all of our psychology since then has more or less accepted that principle. That means that most of the problems that we have in daily life are rooted in unconscious programs for happiness, such as I described before, so that when <laughs> you start out daily life, you're carrying with you a hidden agenda, hidden indeed from you, 
looking for happiness in the gratification of one of those programs, or two of them, or all of them, or in, or in reaffirming your over-identification with some particular group and its values, even if they are over and against the values of the gospel. To enter the inner room, then, is to let go of your ordinary psychological everyday awareness for a certain period of time and turn your uh, attention or open to the spiritual level of our being and deeper to the divine indwelling and to uh, the true self that is all of which are buried in the unconscious for all practical purposes until you seriously undertake the spiritual journey in some form. But notice the emphasis that Jesus gives in this particular wisdom saying. He speaks of fasting and vigils, almsgiving, and saying prayers. We use that text, uh, I guess, at the beginning of Lent. But he also warns at the same time of using these external observances for motives of the false self, such as he recommends washing your face when you're fasting so no one will notice it. Well, I've been in an institution where fasting was a, was a, uh, a source of competition. <laughs> An occupational hazard of certain strict <laughs> forms of life is, is to change your way of competing on the athletic field or in the bar room or, or, in the, or where you spend the night from competing in acts that are of honor in the particular environment you're in, which could be staying up all night, eating less and less. And, and you can give alms, not for the sake of the poor, but so that you, everybody will applaud your, your great philanthropic uh, endeavors. Not that this isn't all right, but it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it does nothing to change the radical program, which is to give up Worldliness. Worldliness is not the place we live, but it's, it's the attachment to one of those three energy centers. So it continues in monasteries, religious life, and ecclesiastical circles, just as well as outside, although there's usually more motivation to change. You hear about it more often. But unless you do change, then uh, of what value is the environment? Not much, except the hope that by staying there long enough, you'll get the message. So Jesus says, value cultivating the spiritual level of your being. Value it, in other words, to the extent of, of detaching yourself temporarily, but really from your external environment and the people who happen to be there and the concerns and turmoil you have about, uh, about what happens with people or events coming in and out of your life. Just think a moment of what daily life is like for you, I mean, as far as your mental activity goes, especially when you're not thinking deliberately of something, such as studying something or, or performing some kind of uh, white-collar job. What are you thinking about and why? And pretty soon it dawns on you that, that ordinary psychological awareness is like being at a great movie where you identify with the characters or the plot in such a way that you forget where you are and, and are completely identified with the show. So you get a kind of catharsis that feels good for five or ten minutes, etc. So, so our ordinary consciousness tends to be dominated by what's happening and events of which we passively accept what's going on most of the time. And we often feel pushed around by what is happening. And hence, when we are frustrated in one of those programs, the afflictive emotions go off, such as anger, grief, 
uh, shame, humiliation, discouragement, uh, and the compensatory attractions of the capital sins, such as lust, greed, gluttony, and other things, which are usually expressions of needs that are unfulfilled. And the great unfulfilled need is that which true happiness is, the experience and relationship ever growing deeper with that which is, with reality, with the ultimate reality, whom we call God in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Entering into the inner room is like attending a lousy movie. <laughs> now you don't identify so much when you come out of here with the events that are going on. <laughs> Rather, you have a, an inner freedom to get up and leave if you want to. And so events then begin to be uh, uh, related to from, with, with an interior freedom that can let some things go and is not unduly pushed around or dominated by the uh, uh, events and our emotional reactions to them. This is the movement of spiritual freedom. And notice that Jesus says after that, close the door. And this is a symbol of the interior dialogue that goes on even when you let go of the external environment of everyday life. When you stop thinking about something deliberate, the imagination comes alive with all kinds of things it's wanted to give its attention to, maybe for five or ten years, so that your mind is filled with all kinds of thoughts that you can't imagine anybody having, let alone you. And so the invitation to close the door is the invitation to stop, at least deliberately, the interior dialogue that goes on 24 hours a day, that circles endlessly around events, people entering and leaving our lives, and our emotional reactions to them. Even our dreams reflect these, this, this world. So, so notice the movement of Jesus' invitation towards deeper levels of silence, interior stillness, as the way to peace and to the source of happiness. Finally, he says, when you get the inner room, have closed the door, let go of the external environment, let go of the interior noise, now you're in a position to relate to the Father where he is, which is silence. You might say silence and God, for all practical purposes, I mean interior silence, are the same thing. Not a thing, of course, but the same sort of experience. And so silence gives the psyche a chance to find out who it is. Thoughts are like a manhole covering a sewer. <laughs> Take off the manhole and you find out what's down there, which is not entirely pleasant. And until we empty out the emotional junk that's accumulated there of a lifetime and stored in the body as a kind of warehouse, we're constantly dealing with afflictive emotions unsatisfied desires, uh, events that are defeating or, or, or upsetting. And, and this is not the way to live. And you, it's not required. You don't have to live this way. And hence, this is what the gospel invites us to. Peace, freedom, love, forgiveness. Wonderful words, but without actually doing them and experiencing the reality that they represent, our life is going to be much, very much of a struggle and a battle, full of disappointments and in serious uh, traumas or, or situations. We won't have the resources to deal with them. 
This is ex extremely important, it seems to me, for those who are leaders in a church that is fundamentally spiritually orientated. If, if we as spiritual leaders don't work on this area of our psyche, then we're going to inevitably cause a lot of unhappiness to other people because we'll be relating to them and events out of our own psychological needs instead of the objective world. The false self is like a center of gravity around which our faculties tend to circulate like planets around the sun and anything that enters into that sphere of emotional magnetism is judged not on its objective reality, but how much does it satisfy or gratify, perhaps unconsciously, our need becoming a desire and then a demand that other people respect our outrageous needs for exaggerated, unlimited security, control, affection, and esteem. It's a formula for unhappiness. And in Jesus' great love, he's trying to heal us. And this is a formula that the fathers and mothers of the desert interpreted, just as I'm interpreting it here, as an invitation to move as a discipline, but primarily as a way of deepening our relationship, which is what prayer in its essence really is, it's deepening our relationship with what is, with the mystery of who we are and of who God is. And what's the reward? These promises, those who pray in secret, the Father who sees in secret, or might be translated possibly, who is in secret, will reward you. What's the reward? unity with the, with the Father, with what Jesus prayed for in his priestly prayer, that they may be one in us as we are one. That's infinite unity as far as I can gather. And it's out of that contemplative space, using the word that gradually became in honor in the early centuries of, of exegesis, it's out of that place that action that is effective really comes. Action inspired by not just an occasional inspiration of the spirit, but the continuing movement of the spirit through the gift of counsel designed to guide us in the trivia or the details of daily life as well as in major decisions. It, this this is, is the vision that Jesus seems to have of the kingdom and of his students or his disciples. And this is the lineage that is passed on through spiritual instruction, spiritual books in some degree, but it's especially transmitted by live contact, that is, by example. An example isn't just the result of behaving well. Example is what you communicate by being who you really are. And if you're a child of God and operating out of the fruits and gifts of the Spirit, you don't have to do anything. You can walk down the street and you're pouring divine love and energy into the universe and into people that you may never know, that you don't even see. So when you undertake the spiritual journey at the contemplative level, the whole human family goes with you. And every little movement of love that you exercise, even in picking up a, a straw for the love of God, as St. Therese of Lisieux put it, for a remarkable insight into the gospel, you don't have to do anything or you can do everything. And it amounts to the same if one's deepest life is rooted in Christ. Life, then, is what God wants it to be for each of us. And everything works. Everything is synchronous. And instead of, you work hard, 
but then you step back and watch it happen because it's not happening because of you, but because of the divine spirit that has finally been able to manifest itself in your uniqueness, with your gifts, and in your situation. This is really one of the greatest, perhaps the greatest gift we can give God. The chance to feel what it's like to be us. No one else can do that. To feel what it's like to be in our particular humanity. No one can ever reproduce this. Hence the enormous dignity of a human being. This has enormous consequences for the world right now. World peace depends on how many people embrace the transformational process that the gospel and other world religions in their spiritual traditions offer. It's not going to be resolved by politics, violence, or other childish ways of trying to resolve human problems or conflict. The human family hasn't yet reached the age of reason as a global species. A few people get there, but not too many. But once, once that level becomes established as the average level of consciousness, all the doors to higher states of consciousness that Jesus talks about, of the kind of faith that moves mountains and, and the kind of love that is ready to lay down its life for everybody else. This becomes a normal way of functioning as a human being and as a Christian. It's totally available if we take some means of accessing the divine indwelling on a regular basis and dismantle, repent of our misguided ways of looking for happiness in the wrong place, places. All of society is moving against that project. Everything is about satisfaction of those three elements. Everything is about defense and acceptance by our group, our self-interest, our national interest. What bunk. Self-interest is death. It's the way to the end of empires, not to build them. And uh, all history has, has shown. Only love can heal this world. And, and here is where contemporary science is, is a great help to us. Some physicists are now saying you, you cannot have a thought without affecting everything else in the universe instantaneously. All of scripture emphasizes the oneness of the human family, the very creation of Adam and Eve as, as, as the, a single parent, parents. And the Eve even came from Adam, if I'm not mistaken. So that everything came, if all human life in that view, came out of uh, Adam. But that doesn't mean we have to believe that as a historical fact. <laughs> the message of scripture is, that the human family is one, absolutely one as a species, so that we're individual but uh, social in our very being, so that anything we do or anything anybody else does is affecting everything in the universe down to quarks. This is this modern science talking, not the mystics, but it sounds a lot like the mystics. Uh, when you translate this into the mystical body of Christ in that teaching, uh, as you know, Paul in his day says that we're members of one another and that you, the eye can't say to the foot, I don't need you, and then the, uh, uh, the humbler parts of the body are just as important as other parts. <clears throat> we now know from, from biophysics and cellular structure that every cell is, is a holon, that is to say, it has its own identity and is part of a bigger holon, which is part of a bigger holon. So a cell is usually part of an organ or some tissue structure or muscle. So of our very nature, we're interrelated and interconnected. 
And, and this is the doctrine that would undermine all the social, political, ethnic, and other stupid barriers that humanity has. So the cell has this interesting quality, according to biophysics. Each cell has the DNA that is characteristic of every other cell, which contains the whole program of the particular body. So that the, so that the molecular structure of the cell, as it produces new cells, is then takes information from the DNA and, and proceeds to that part of the body to which it's assigned to build, let us say, the kidneys or the heart or tissue or the nervous system and so on. So the cells are completely for the common good. They don't hesitate a moment in going to places to heal wounds, even though this means its own death, perhaps. So the, so the interrelatedness of the body is held together and, uh, by, the, by the soul, the spirit that inhabits every part of the body. So in the mystical body of Christ, if Christ is his head, the Holy Spirit is, is infused throughout the body, and indeed this is clearly in Revelation. Jesus said to his first church people, receive the Holy Spirit. So the whole body is penetrated by the mind of Christ that is manifested through the theological virtues, the fruits of the Spirit, and the other elements of that trousseau we received in baptism. So, <clears throat> so Christ then, in his spirit, is present to us in virtue of grace and baptism so intimately that we can't imagine it. And the spirit might be called the divine DNA that is present in each of us and conforming us or disposing us to the common good of the whole mystical body, that is, to the purpose of the human race, which is the salvation of everybody else. So now it's not just your spiritual journey or your perfection or your purification that is important, but rather the, the extension or expansion of the kingdom through the power of the spirit to the whole human family and its transformation. From this perspective, can we ever be happy as long as anyone isn't saved? The characteristic of compassion and the love that Jesus speaks about, the love that he manifests, is to be ready to receive everyone into one's heart and their suffering and to make them one's own, and to be willing to suffer some of their burdens. So that for all we know in the spiritual journey with its psychological ups and downs, the trials that come from daily life, once you're on this journey, you're identified with the passion of Christ. Hence, it's inevitable that one is going to bear a part of the world's burden of redemption. So, we become healers, not because we're worthy, but because we're members of a body that is all about healing. And, and so this, this perspective would change the world. If we're all one, it makes no sense, no sense at all, to set up barriers, walls, windows, doors. Uh, true, you have to have some defense from from people who are psychologically or, or socially disturbed, there needs to be some obvious uh, protection from such things. But the needless barriers are going to be taken down. As Paul says, in the body of Christ, or in, in Christ, th there is no Jew or Greek. There is no Scythian or whatever it was. There is no male or female. And there is no slave or free. Well, why can't we add, there is no Protestant or Catholic, or there is no Christian or Buddhist or Hindu. All those categories remained after Paul said this. So what he's communicating is an attitude 
that we have to develop understanding, respect, a willingness to help, and even to share in the sufferings of people who are not identified with our ethnic group, nation, self-interest, oil wells, or whatever the heck it is, is, is that we're attached to. And, and this is the freedom that the gospel invites us to. It's to be everybody else like God is. That's what happiness is. To be free, to be who we are, and to be anybody else that God might want us to be. In other words, it's a letting go of our self-identity and to be willing to continue growing and becoming an ever new self, or as Paul calls it, a new creation, as, as we are assimilated to the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is that his resurrection and its power be communicated, transmitted throughout the whole body of time, past, present, and the future. In God, there is no time. So everything is, is now. And at this moment, even as we sit here, we're in relationship to everything that exists, not only humanly, but in all creation, down to the smallest of quarks. According to the Big Bang Theory, everything came out of one element so that you and I are just recycled stardust of one kind or another as far as our physical. <laughs> we're, so we're part of this universe. So from this perspective, the whole universe is the body of Christ in which the divine goodness is being manifest according to the principle of infinite diversity that is present in the Trinity along with infinite unity. So God is both at once. Hence, our idea of God is in constant need of expansion. And, and I recommend highly having a big idea of God. He's not nasty. He's not picky -une. He's not inflexible. He is not rigid. He, he is forgiveness itself. And the only chief thing he asks of us is to do the same. And you can only forgive those fully with whom you feel a certain oneness. This is the social goal of the spiritual journey. And, and, and this is a, a process a way of life of which the formula of Jesus is simply uh, an entrance way, but, but pretty much if you study those principles in the light of the explanations of the early fathers of the church and the desert fathers, everything is, is in God's hands. Everything comes from love, even though it doesn't look that way to us. Everything is an invitation to receive the maximum amount of divine life, enlightenment, and love that we can possibly receive. And it's that which glorifies God because it manifests the fruit or the grace of the resurrection for, for which Jesus suffered so much to make available. All time is just time in which the, the full effects of the resurrection is transmitted to the whole universe.